We certainly look at every day that we have here as um, being ready to expect the unexpected. It's a pretty unique situation, meeting someone probably on the worst day of their life. Accidents happen, people make mistakes, we're, we're not perfect. And when that does happen, uh, we rely on the help of others to get us out of trouble. You, you're going to work, sort of going, well, okay, what's the weather like for the day? Which way is the wind blowing? Is the subtly coming through? What's the worst time of the day? We've got routines, you know, daily briefs and aircraft checks, but all of a sudden the bat phone, as we affectionately call it, can ring and then... Steam for about two hours north when I noticed some black smoke. Um, went downstairs and there was already two or three tonne of water swelling around the motor. Um, I knew we were going to sink. And uh, then realised I've got to get the kids because they were asleep. My dad or Rick got us, got us up and we put our life jackets on. My thoughts were to them but also to Rick because I know he's not a strong swimmer. That's why I grabbed the esky. I just jumped into the water off the top of the boat. I only had to swim a couple of metres and grab an, a, the esky. The boat went from a 45 to vertical and sunk within a split second. And Rick looked at me and said, what happened? I said, it sunk. He was in shock. He's obviously in shock. Um, the lure we were towing came past and it hooked on another lure that had got stuck on his jacket, his spray jacket. So he got dragged under the water, pulled his spray jacket off his body, came back up in a panic, and then the lure dug into his knee and drug him back under the water again. The bat phone had gone off and we'd received a call that only there was a triple O call. We knew that there was someone off Sydney in trouble. That's it, that's all we knew. So we prepared ourselves for more than one person in the water, but we didn't know whether we were coming to 30 people in the water or two or one. And I just kept telling the boys and Rick, don't worry, everything's all right. We've got the EPIRB, we're gonna be right. Um, Westpac Lifesaver will come. I knew who would be coming. The first thing we looked for was craft to give us any indication that, that they'd either seen a vessel go down or, or they're in, in fact them, themselves in distress. And there was none of that. We had an indication from Australian Search and Rescue in Canberra that um, there had been a glimmer of a distress beacon more south towards Sydney Heads. You can see the land, but it felt like thousands of miles away. By this stage, we're sort of an hour, an hour and 15 into, into the search. Um, I remember the wind had started picking up and pushing the swell, so it was starting to white cap. Things were starting to look very bad. You could tell the boys were slipping into a bit of shock. I was feeling weak, and um, I didn't know. It. If it didn't come, I didn't know. And things were sort of going through my mind, like um, whether I'm going to see the family again. The worst fear for that hour that we were in the water was that we were going to lose the boys. We had maps out, we had computer programs up running and everything to try and figure out where might they be. When we first found them, what we saw was two life jackets. That's all we spotted, because it was a grey esky and almost a grey water, and everyone was wearing dark clothes. And there was two or three choppers all in a row, there was film crew um, and the Westpac rescue. It was the best feeling. We're, yeah, we're saved. I'm gonna see me son again. Four people, we can't retrieve all at once. With the equipment that we've got on board, we've got a 10 person life raft and we thought we had um, other services. Um, police, water police are on the way. And I deemed that the safest thing to do was to actually not winch, um, but wait for the water police. We decided at that stage, get a life raft to them, get them out of the water. Once we got in that raft, I give me Ryan a cuddle and yeah, it was the best feeling. It felt good to know that they were now in a much more controlled environment. It was just another day we thought that we, you know, we were very excited. We just bought the boat, we were taking it to Yamba. And um, I said, how good is this? And we're just on top of the world. And then 50 seconds later, we are at the lowest point in my life, I think. I knew that Westpac Lifesaver would come because they're the people that save everyone when they, like, this boat sinks or something happens. If Westpac Lifesaver uh, Rescue didn't exist, I don't know whether I'd be here today, because I, I, I was not in a good way. I kept telling them, don't worry, they'll come, they'll come, and sure enough, they did. 
We have two aircraft, uh, both BK-117s. They're operated, uh, one's operated here in Sydney, one is on the uh, south coast at uh, Maruya, at, uh, just south of Batemans Bay. This particular service operates from the central coast down to the Victorian border, way out to sea. Our aircraft are capable of going you know, many, many, many kilometres out to sea, and of course as far west as we need to. And we have a total of, of 50 staff at the moment, and that includes our volunteers. We don't. Not for a moment would we differentiate employees versus uh, volunteers, is that they're part of the team. Some of the, the crew that we've got are volunteers and they volunteer their time to go out and save people. It could be someone off the cliffs, which is only 250 metres from where we're sitting right now. And we've got to be fast, we've got to react really quickly. You're just coming down from a job and then the phone goes off again and you, you, one minute you're 15 miles off Bondi and the next minute you're up in Katoomba. We are ready for anything because the skeleton of our training does allow us to, to adapt to most any situations. Uh, that professionalism stems from, the, uh, from all staff down to the operational crew. Uh, it's critical in this job uh, when it's all about saving lives. And we're working with people, our patients, uh, yes, very glad to see us, but they're panicking, they're scared, they don't know um, if they're going to survive this ordeal. As I'd woken up that morning, um, we definitely that I was going home today, and um, I'd had a pretty smooth but difficult time up until that point, um, mentally and physically, and uh, I decided that I was going to head for home, which is a longer walk than I'd normally do in a day, but I thought I could do it. At the start of each day, we sort of go through our daily routine, um, have our brief, but you never know when something's going to happen. When things started to not go according to plan, I was well and truly off track, far from any track at this point, um, out of water. The actual time of um, the moment of activating the EPIRB was a, a big decision for me. The call came through around 12.30, so it gave us a few hours to play with, although it was extremely remote and rugged and actually finding the signal proved quite difficult. When I did actually first hear the sound of the chopper um, approaching, it was a mixture of relief, and obviously hoping help was nearby, um, but panic because it still sounds far away. Uh, it, confusing when you're in the mountains, you're not quite sure where it's coming from. The signal from the EPIRB was bouncing around um, everywhere around the cliff, so it was, it was a process of elimination going between the valleys and that sort of stuff to identify the signal. Which puts my location somewhere within a radius of several kilometres. And if you're looking at that from the sky, it looks like, it looks like Papua New Guinea. I did have a shaving mirror in my bag, a plastic shaving mirror. And finally we saw Pete's heliograph, the shining light towards us, that, which we'd be able to spot him between the trees. To be rescued on the ground could have taken a couple of days and the uh, terrain was extremely rugged, so there only really seemed one option of winching down and picking him up. I was on a, a slope here, there was a sheer face here and there's high trees here, so they really had a really small window where they were able to lower Harry, who, who was rescuing me at the time, down um, without getting the chopper too close to the mountain face. Just relying on my weight, just pushing me through the trees. That was Harry, what he had to do to try and hold the chopper steady. Uh, it was quite windy so close to the proximity of the cliff face and to get him down between the trees, which the chopper was coincidentally making fly everywhere. When I, when I did find him, he seemed relieved that we were there. What Harry, who got winched down to me, had to face from his point of view and the fact that he just still went through and did it anyway, um, speaks volumes about, you know, just the courage that they use in their line of work. I really don't think the greater community understand how much it costs when people, you know, sitting at, talking to people over dinner and they are, start asking questions and tell them it costs, you know, anywhere between $3,800 and $4,000 an hour to run an aircraft. They're just, they're gobsmacked. There's absolutely no doubt that our biggest challenge is um, the financial one, to keep this place going. People sometimes don't understand that. Why are you going that extra? Why you, you know, why does it cost you that much when you could do it for a little bit cheaper? It's, it's because it's, it's all down to safety uh, and professionalism. They think that we're financially secure and explaining to them that 
first of all, no, Westpac don't own us. Yes, we do need your support. We have a portion of government funding, approximately 50% of the shortfall that we've got to go out and get. Aviation is an expensive beast, but it is probably one of the most efficient and effective forms of search and rescue going around. You can always question the, the reason as to why we spend money on search and rescue, uh, but the proof's in the pudding. We save lives. Sea so started getting a bit swelly and I thought, oh, I think we should be going in now. We was out for an hour and the sun said, oh, it'll be okay. I said, no, no, I think we'd better go in it. It's looking, the waves are getting a little bit rolly. And uh, we started back and then also, I think we got too close to the rocks where the water was swirling around a bit. And next thing I knew, we were sort of going round and round and then the boat was over and it was under the water. I had the life jacket on, I came up and I noticed my son had swum and got to some high rocks and he screamed at me to, to swim towards him, which I was too, the waves were too harsh, I couldn't get there. We intercepted a radio uh, rescue call from Batemans Bay uh, Portable, who was a surf club there. And I uh, swam towards these rocks, but I was being dragged away from them. And I finally got to the very end of the rocks. If I'd have missed those, I'd have gone past it. Who knows what have happened. It's possible that they couldn't see him from the beach, given the, um, the, the surf conditions around where he was. I finally got lucky and got my legs wrapped around the rocks, but the waves were still building. It would have been about five minutes from the time we intercepted that radio call to the time we were overhead the patient. Our assessment on site, looking at what he was doing on the rocks and how much he was struggling, was that uh, essentially he didn't have that much longer to, to survive. I thought I was gone. Even though I had a life jacket on, I thought, this is it. I was swallowing lots and lots of water as the waves were hitting. We brought the helicopter around very quickly and got ready for our snatch and grab rescue, which is our fastest type of rescue. I was holding, I was looking round, I turned my head and I looked up and I couldn't believe it in such a short time. I, I thought I was dreaming, I thought this can't be right, I'm, I'm hallucinating, there was a helicopter. At that point, we, uh, Joe was ready, we brought the helicopter straight in and we were able to put Harry directly beside Peter in the water. The, the rotors were sort of pushing me about as well, so I couldn't look, I just held, held down, I had my head down holding onto the rocks. Next thing I felt, Grateful feeling of a guy grabbing me. And when he fell on to the rescue crew officer, um, I was using some winch cable to uh, hold them out of the water to stop uh, Harry from being pushed underwater. Yeah, I just remember I was just feeling grateful to have this guy wrapped around me and he was pulling me up. I was a pretty heavy guy. I'm thinking, they've got to get me in. And they finally got me on the deck. Now, I was that grateful. And when we brought him on board, he seemed in a, in a semi-conscious state. And I quite quickly uh, radioed for ambulance assistance. I mean, I've always taken it, seeing them on television, blah, and say, oh, another rescue, you know, good luck to those guys, and not thinking it's, I'd be one of those guys. The coastal environment's very unforgiving. Uh, w without us, uh, it's highly likely that Peter would have, would have drowned. To make sure that they do come home is obviously that we have to make sure that they're well trained, that we have the best possible people on board the aircraft, highly skilled pilots and crew, that the aircraft is working at, at its best. Safety is, is the, the top of the list of things considered uh, before any flight. Is, is what we're doing the best for the patient? Is the helicopter in a safe environment? Can we do this in a, in a more effective manner? At the end of the day, it takes all three of us to get the platform to the site to provide that stable platform to put the swimmer in the water or the swimmer in the trees or whatever the uh, rescue crewman needs to do to affect the rescue. This is about making sure that someone returns to their family at the end of the day. The drop of a hat, you know, I you just get in the aircraft and go. No planning, no prior planning and you're out there quite often just as soon as the subtleties come in and it's really rough weather and that's when people get in trouble. Without us here, there's, there's nobody else to effect rescue within the time that's required. People will die. You may not need us, but someone you know and love may need us one day. It is just another day at the office for us, every rescue. But if you can make that small part of that day a little easier to get through and try and help in some small way to get people back to their family, at the end of the day, then we've achieved their objective.